smart women want to learn how to transform their intimate relationships. We feel frustrated, disconnected and lackluster in our relationships, but we are done with blaming our partners. We are done with doing nothing about it. We are ready to do our bit to make things better so that we feel more connected, more alive, more truly ourselves in our intimate relationships. Are your lady parts numb? That is, if you're a woman. Men, you're more than welcome to keep listening. But how much feeling do you have down there? My guest today is Tamara Mercica, and she is all about self-love, and she means self-love on every level, which means that Tamara really encourages us to love and care for our vaginas. Tamara is the founder of Getting Naked and Yoga for the Vagina. She's a relationship and self-love therapist and an author. If the idea of getting back into a state of love with your vagina makes you uncomfortable, then actually this episode is for you. Tamara talks us through some of the health issues and benefits of having a healthy, loving relationship with down there. In this episode, we also talk about the relationship with self and its effect on everything the fierceness of boundaries that motherhood brings and how Tamara had to have strong boundaries with her own mother and all the things, the juicy good things that you can learn from dating. Enjoy. Tamara, you have so many beautiful online programs um, and one that I wanted to start speaking about was yoga for the vagina. Um, you have a really amazing program that helps people use jade eggs and plus more. Um, I'm wondering what the importance of having a, a healthy vagina is for our relationships. Mm-hmm. So our society is uh, filled with conditioning around pleasure, around our vaginas, and so many of us are brought up in a way that has us disconnect from our vagina. And, you know, so many women, they see their vagina as ugly and um, they they just don't want to look at it. You know, a lot of women haven't actually looked at all of the details down there. <laughs> um, and it's such a beautiful part well, of us. Act- have actively avoided looking at it. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and there's so many beautiful pleasure spots down there that just want to be explored. Um, and I suppose um, for me, uh, the, the love that we have around our vagina is a direct mirror of the love that we have for ourselves because our vagina is our most feminine aspect, our most feminine part of ourselves. Um, and, and our vagina has the ability to actually store a lot of trauma and a lot of conditioning and a lot of stuck emotion. And so it's from there that we can actually start to heal ourselves. Um, but if we're not willing to actually go there and feel into what our vagina is telling us, then essentially we're... we're I suppose, missing out on connecting with a part of us that has so much to share with us. Mm. And, you know, this conditioning that we get, it comes in many different forms. You know, from a young age, girls are shamed about their parts and taught what they can and can't use them for and we're told to keep our legs together. Um, And then when we get to adults and we start being exposed to porn, we're actually seeing what a vagina should look like which obviously isn't the case because all of these women have these tiny little vaginas that well I should say vulva because the vulva is the outside part that we see (laughs) they have these vulvas um, that look a certain way and so they're being cast into these roles because they look that certain way just as we see models cast as models for the for the you know magazines They're, they're cast because they look a certain way 
But that certain way, that that's not um, that's not perfect. That's not um, what we should be striving for. What we should be striving for is to have connection to what our body does and what it gives us, as opposed to how it looks. Yes. And Actually, part. Of- um, sorry to interrupt you there, but uh, I recently went to the Mona Art Gallery in Hobart, mm-hmm. and they have um, uh, I don't know maybe a hundred vagina mold sculptures so real awesome. vaginas that have been molded and it is not only fascinating to walk through and look at all these vaginas but it is liberating i found it so liberating to go oh my god yeah this is this gives me permission <laughs> <laughs> to just go yep this is my vagina this is what when- it's like when was the last time that you went up to your friends and had a look at all their vaginas? Oh. <laughs> you know, Probably we don't do that. A primary school. If I, I don't even remember doing it then. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, we, we don't, we're not exposed to what everyday vaginas look like. And, um, you know, I've actually got a, a vagina book and it's all of the, this collection of photos of everyday vaginas. And they're everyday wonderful. Everyday vaginas. I love it. <laughs> You know, they, 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 they're all different shapes and colours and sizes and often one lady is longer than the other and some hang really low um, and that is beautiful. You know, if, if I, I like to comp- compare them, them to flowers because flowers come in all different shapes and sizes and that doesn't make a rose prettier than a tulip, you know. Um, no. So, uh, you know, and, and, and the problem with, you know, being exposed to these uh, designer vaginas, if you want to call them that, <laughs> that we see in porn, um, is that women feel insecure and they actually start getting surgery and there's a lot of women getting labiaplasticity. Yeah, so what they're doing is they're having part of their vulva area chopped off and the problem with this is not only is it a, um, it's a mental, emotional issue, but um, you're actually chopping off core places that are designed to give us pleasure and so as you chop those off you're actually limiting your your ability to be able to experience pleasure yes i know Mm. that um sorry to interrupt again but in uganda and i've watched Mm. this amazing documentary i've mentioned it plenty of times before um they actually pull their labia from a really young sort of uh premenstrual age because they believe that that is the key to pleasure. And so they pull it to elongate it. So the longer, the better, the pleasure. And that's mm-hmm. their kind of cultural custom. And then they get they hear about people cutting theirs off because they don't like it dangling out. And they're like, why would you do that? You know, total shock. Mm, yeah. It's amazing. It's so amazing what... But, you know, it happens with every body part. You know, women are getting breast implants. They're getting liposuction to get their mm. eyes smaller. Um, we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people. Um, and it's that comparison to other people that is um, essentially, you know, something that you specialize in, abandoning that self-love, mm. abandoning self. Um, and we don't want to be doing comparison. We actually want to be just feeling into <clears throat> what is my truth and what am I here to experience and really trusting the sensations in our body as opposed to how it looks. And when you follow the sensations as opposed to looks, then you actually fall in love with how you look as well. Yeah, and it feels like the vagina is kind of a portal into self-acceptance and love in a way because it's that part of us that has been shamed that you know, we've kind of thought is so ugly or smelly or whatever. So yeah. <laughs> when we can actually embrace that, yeah. there's, there's a kind of wholeness about our self-love in a way. Absolutely. You know, in order to fall in love with yourself fully, you need to accept your body fully, and that includes your vagina. And so I really do see our relationship with our vagina playing a massive role in our love for ourself. Um, And, you know, unfortunately, there is a lot of shame and fear and guilt instilled in us around sex and pleasure and our lady parts. Um, And the way that this can actually play out for a lot of women is that 
Some women start feeling numb in that area. This is why a lot of women need external stimulation of the clitoris in order to experience orgasm during um, intercourse because inside their vagina is actually numb. Um, For other women, they'll be experiencing pain during intercourse. um, And some women start creating sexual health issues. And I say they start creating sexual health issues because um, whether it's thrush or endometriosis or you know, whatever it is that's come up for you, that has all started with a thought. And when we have a thought, that triggers a chemical response in the body. And if that thought is positive, it guides the body to be well. If that thought's negative, it actually sickens the body. And so if we're having negative thoughts about our vagina, well, then what we're doing is we're sending toxic chemicals, if you like, to that body area and making it sick ourselves. And, you know, if you look at the stats with, you know, one in three women have experienced some form of sexual abuse, of course there is this disconnect and this hate towards their vagina because that is the part of them that has been entered without their permission. Mm. Yep. And it's the place of pain and trauma. Mm. Mm. Yep. So they're holding on to that story Mm. and manifesting in something a lot worse. Yeah. yeah what what's your relationship been with your vagina has, has that changed and evolved over the years yeah absolutely um i as a child i was a very curious person i suppose you would say <laughs> um and you know I, I remember and you know i was very embarrassed about this for for a long time but i remember i was in prep at school and there was this other girl in class and we take it in times, time, terms during story time to actually just give each other's bum a massage. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't really sexual. It just felt nice and we take it in turns. And, and for a very long time I had a lot of shame and, and guilt around that because, um, you know, I was brought up in a family that sex is, well, we don't speak about that. And, you know, when I got my period I was handed a, a box of, Um, pads and a book to learn how to deal with it myself and that was the only discussion that we had and so for me it was like oh I'm curious about this thing but I feel guilty about this thing Um, and so you know when I had my first sexual experience it wasn't bad you know I had it with a guy I'd been dating for seven months so it wasn't a horrible experience Um, But then I suppose what I experienced later on was I was having a lot of thrush issues. Um, So I had thrush for probably about eight years on and off. And then I received an abnormal pap smear result and was diagnosed as being the stage before cancer. And that was probably the first time that I went, okay, there's obviously been some disconnection from my vagina that I wasn't consciously aware of Mm -hmm. and I need to explore this. And so, you know, the gynecology wanted to, gynecologist wanted to operate straight away because I was a high risk category. And by that point I was doing a lot of um, emotional clearing work and I preferred to take a more natural route. So I did the techniques that I use on myself um, with my clients Um, and I also use the jade egg, which you mentioned earlier. Um, and within, I think it was about four months, I was given the all clear and the the gynecologist claimed it was a miracle that I'd been able to heal myself completely. And I, I look back on that now and I see that as such a pivotal point in taking me into the field of women's sexual health, because that's an area that I'm now actively involved in and actively teaching because I've seen how many women are experiencing these kinds of things and they don't have good resources to go to. Um, So for me, that was a real awakening. Um, And, you know, I wasn't someone, I I was never sexually abused, so that wasn't my road into women's sexual health. Um, But I did have a lot of sexual health issues. Yeah. And so that... And and like you say... Nothing dramatic happened, no big trauma, but still all that guilt and shame and absolutely um, you know it doesn't doesn't it it's kind of no matter what <laughs> there's enough in just our culture and social social sort of conditioning to create problems down there 
Yeah. And and that's where, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, something big and bad didn't happen to you. But what we need to recognize is that mental and emotional conditioning, that is at the core of every single thing that we experience in our life. And it's at the core of how we feel about ourselves and how we how much we love ourselves. Mm-hmm. And if we don't love ourselves, then essentially we're going to live a life that's full of struggle, full of hardship. And, you know, it may not be by way of our romantic relationships. It may be by way of financial or, you know, something else or health or whatever it is. But we need to have that solid sense of self. We need to have really positive programming so we do essentially fall in love with ourselves um, because so, that yes. is the core of us. Yeah. So now your relationship with your v- vagina, tell us a bit about that. Um, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 um, I'm, I'm always that girl at the party that, you know, if, if there's an in to talk about vaginas, I will talk about <laughs> vaginas. <laughs> and, and I think what, what everyone um, loves is that women don't generally feel comfortable talking about their vagina and as soon as I give them that in, they're just like, oh, this sense of relief of, yes, I can talk about what I'm experiencing. Um, and that is huge for people. Um, so, you know, in relation to my own vagina, I feel I feel good about it. You know, I have my own practices that I do with it. Um, it's an ongoing journey, obviously. Um, and, yeah, I don't, I don't feel negatively about it. I don't feel there's anything I need to change about it. It's, um, yeah. It's nice. So, so I'm wondering, because the women that uh, listen in to this podcast are generally interested in helping their relationship to thrive, their primary intimate relationships to mm-hmm. thrive. And I'm wondering now if they're thinking, oh, God, I really don't have a relationship with my vagina. In fact, I feel when I feel into how... I feel about my vagina, it's quite negative. Mm-hmm. How do you think, and maybe they're thinking, I, I'm not going there, but I want you to kind of explain to them why it's important if they're really wanting to thrive in their relationships. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that we do in our relationship with our partner is sex. It's something that we don't do with, or generally don't do with our next door neighbor or our family <laughs> members. Or, yeah, there you are know, some that it, have it, an agreement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, generally speaking, um, it's, it's something that you do either by yourself or you do it with your intimate partner. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm not a believer that sex is the make-all and break-all of a relationship. You know, I've certainly gone for stints without having sex with my partner and because we're still intimate, um, I don't, neither of us feel like we're missing out on anything. Mm. But on the same token, if you are not embracing that part of yourself and you don't feel comfortable with that part of yourself, you're going to be limiting your experience of pleasure. Mm. And, you know, I mentioned before a lot of women are not experiencing the vaginal orgasms and we have a G-spot orgasm that we can experience, which is much more emotional it's much deeper and if we're holding on to a lot of fear we're not actually going to be able to experience that um so you know being able to connect with your vagina and be open to moving through that fear is what's going to allow you to have these deeper emotional rolling orgasms that you can literally have one after the next after the next that are sort of like fireworks popping out of the sky um that sort of experience and then you also have the cervix which for many women is actually really um tender it can be quite painful to touch but the cervix is in you know Taoist reflexology it's actually connected to the heart And so as we start to awaken the cervix, which is at the top of the vaginal canal, we actually start to open ourselves to much deeper Mm self-love. And so when we start to massage that area, and you do want to massage it really softly because it's essentially about as sensitive as your eyeball. Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, You know, if if it's getting pounded, you know, a lot, that's why it will be tender or it will be numb. Um, So gentle massage of the cervix is really beautiful in helping to awaken you to be able to have full body orgasms. Mm -hmm. And the full body orgasms I'm talking about is 
when you're able to actually connect with all that is, which is why women often call this a spiritual experience and it can be really quite transformational and they clear out a lot of stuff in this beautiful, pleasurable, multi-beautiful, yummy experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so I suppose from a um, pleasure perspective, there is so much to gain from connecting with your um, vagina And as you open that up and you start to feel that deep self-love for yourself through this pleasure, then your whole life becomes a lot more pleasurable. So I often talk about it's not just about what you do in the bedroom. That's, That's not just the pleasure that we want to be experiencing. When you go for a walk, when you're walking to work or when you're you know, shopping at the supermarket, you want every experience that you have in life to be pleasurable. And that's not your orgasming in the aisle while you're picking out your fruit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actually just feeling this feeling of peace and um, oneness with all that is and just really enjoying every delicious moment of life. And that's what starts to become available to you when you have that deep connection to yourself and that deep connection to your vagina. So that's, I suppose, just one of the benefits. I mean, obviously, you're going to be a lot healthier in your lady parts as well. Um, You know, if we look at the statistics, 44% of women will experience some form of sexual organ prolapse in their lifetime. And one in three women will need a hysterectomy by the time they're 60. So the stats are really quite shocking. And part of the reason for this is because women are disconnected from their lady parts. They're disconnected from their vagina. And they haven't, I suppose, educated themselves on how to look after those parts from a mental perspective, but also from a physical perspective. And, you know, these sorts of things like sexual organ prolapse, that's preventable. Um, and so I suppose that's something that I look at a lot with the yoga for the vagina program that I run is how to actually look after your sexual organs so they don't quite literally fall out of your vagina, which is what can happen to some people. Yeah. Yep. Um, so if women are sort of thinking, yeah, um, I don't have a very good relationship with my vagina. I think I want to have a better relationship with my vagina. What are your, what's what's the entry point starting place to start developing that? So my suggestion would be get a little bit of coconut oil and just start to massage your vulva area. Mm. That's it. And maybe if you feel as you're starting to massage your vulva area that there is shame or guilt or fear or any of that coming up, just rest your hand wherever that, that feeling is coming up and just breathe into it. And that simple practice in itself can be extremely healing. Mm. And that's where I would start. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I teach people how to use the jade egg internally. But if you're totally disconnected from the vagina, the last thing you want is to be putting something up there. (laughs) So start with just external. It's interesting you say that because I have... um recommended the jade egg to many of my clients Mm. and interestingly quite a few have been very resistant to actually starting and using Mm -hmm. the jade Mm -hmm. egg um so they're not ready you know (laughs) then we then we have to backtrack a bit and go okay so that's interesting let's let's start at stage one rather than stage two or three Absolutely. And it's, and you know, the way that I teach it in my course is that um, if you don't feel comfortable to use the jade egg on the first practice, just sit it next to you and do the whole practice without the jade egg. And so the practice starts with actually just filling yourself with love, feeling that beautiful self-love that is actually within you, starting with a beautiful breast massage, getting connected to your breasts, doing the vulva massage, and then moving into some different poses where you're, you're taught to gently squeeze and release the vagina in a way that's really nourishing to all of your sexual organs. And so you might do that 10, 20 times before you actually introduce the jade egg. And that's absolutely okay because that's the process that you need to go through at that particular point. Mm. 
Yes, mm. and um, we'll talk a little later about your beautiful program mm. that you have. Some women, a lot of us actually, struggle to put ourselves first, struggle to nurture ourselves when we are mothers, wives, sisters, workers, whatever else is going on, all the other roles that we play. Connecting with our vagina takes time Mm -hmm. and space Mm -hmm. and, you know, even within our intimate relationship, often we feel if we want to, uh, to make that more alive and thriving, then we need to directly put energy into him or her or our partner <laughs> so so i suppose my question is where do you where do you find the permission to give yourself that energy that time and what is the fine line there between nurturing self versus nurturing relationship so it's my belief that Every relationship that we have in our life, whether it be with our intimate partner, whether it be with our family members, our children, whether it be a relationship with our health, with our finances, all of those relationships are dependent on our relationship with ourselves. It all starts with you. And so if you don't have a healthy relationship with yourself, then there'll be certain areas of your life that are going a bit AWOL, a bit weird. They're not quite working well. And so if someone comes to me and says, well, my relationship with my partner isn't working, then I say, well, which part of your relationship with you isn't working? Mm -hmm. Because it's actually got nothing to do with your partner. And so we see this a lot in our uh, relationships with our partner. And oftentimes we'll feel like, oh, my partner isn't listening to me, my partner's doing this thing that really bugs me and, you know, like we're just not finding time for each other. And these are all things that you can look at yourself. So when I say that, I mean look at the mirror reflection. What's going on for you? If your partner's not making time for you, it's probably an indication that you're not making time for yourself. Mm -hmm. If your partner isn't listening to you, where are you in your life not listening to yourself? And maybe it's not around, you know, when when I say you're not listening to yourself, maybe it is that you're not listening to that inner guidance or maybe it's that you're not listening to work colleagues Mm. or maybe it is, in fact, in your intimate relationship that you're not listening to that person either. Yeah, but I'm I'm just wanting to play the devil's advocate here and, Mm. and, and speak up for the woman who's now going, hang on a sec, no, Yeah. he doesn't listen to me. Yeah, I'm and that, listening. Absolutely. He is not, or whatever. And that may be the that may actually be playing out, and it probably is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm not saying that that's not playing out. Mm-hmm. But the reason that he's not listening to you is because there's somewhere in your life that you're not listening to you. Mm-hmm. And maybe it just is you're not listening to that inner voice, that inner guidance, on what you need for you. And maybe that inner voice is telling you, oh, "I just need you know time out." half an hour every week just to do something that nurtures me. Mm. And when we start listening to that inner voice or we start seeing that reflection and healing whatever it is that's being brought to our attention to look at, then we will start behaving and reacting, or not reacting, but behaving and interacting with our partners in a very different way. And then as a result, they will start treating us differently. And so the problem comes is when we blame the other person and we make them the problem Mm -hmm. because the real problem, as confronting as it is, is it's us not being willing to look at our stuff. And so I know that. Sadly, I know this is true. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the best thing that you can do when you're in a relationship is write down all of the things that really give you the gripes about your partner. Write (laughs) down. Go nuts on it, right? And then go, right, where am I doing these things in my life? Mm -hmm. And take To myself primarily. 
Yeah, or to other people. Yeah. Yeah. Because it may be a case that your partner is um, a little reactive to you Mm. and, you know, you'll say things and he just reacts. And maybe you're quite reactive to your father. Maybe that's where you're doing it. Uh, Maybe you're doing it straight back at your partner. (laughs) But you'll be doing it somewhere. And so we want to bring awareness to what are your patterns Where are you doing this? And, you know, if we take a totally spiritual um, look at things, um, nothing else exists. It's just us if we're going to go totally spiritual-like, okay? (laughs) And the world around us, the people in it, they are just reflections of our stuff. And so we can use life, we can use our partner as our greatest teacher to actually look at our stuff. And when you're willing to do that, then all of a sudden you can take full responsibility for your experience of your life. Because as long as you are blaming your partner for treating you a certain way, then essentially you're you're allowing yourself to be a victim. You're disempowering yourself. And so if someone in your life is treating you a certain way, you can ask for them to treat you differently. And you you can set some boundaries around how you wish to be treated. And that's not always easy. Sometimes that's really quite difficult and it's finding a way to make peace with that and be okay with that. Does that answer you? Absolutely. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, Which leads beautifully into uh, something I'd love to find out from you, which is uh, where where you're challenged these days (laughs) in this realm of really opening to love and taking responsibility. Yeah, so I have been on quite a journey uh, through my life and I didn't receive the most loving upbringing um, from my parents. Obviously, your parents love you. Your parents are always going to love you, but they may not be able to express it to you. Mm -hmm. And this forms the basis for how loved you feel throughout your life. And um, it also forms the basis for how you allow people to treat you. Mm. And I, you know, you said to me you wanted to know what my challenges were and I was thinking about this before we we got on the podcast. And the challenge has actually been around my my relationship with my mother Mm. because from a very young age she has had, um, I mean, she had me very young And she had a lot of challenges in her own life. And she didn't know how to process those challenges. And so the easiest way to deal with that was essentially to take them out on me. And so this set up a pattern of me allowing other people to disrespect me, to treat me in ways that I wasn't comfortable with. And while I would stand up for that, I I didn't know how to set boundaries around it to the point that um, that person would stop treating me that way. I'd still put myself in that environment over and over again, even though I'd be like, this is not cool. And so my biggest challenge recently has been around this because I'm currently 29 weeks pregnant, (laughs) which is very exciting. And my husband and I are very excited about it. Um, But uh, I got to the point before I got pregnant that because of the behaviour of my mother, it's become quite volatile of recent years, that I didn't actually feel comfortable with my mother um, being part of my child's life. And that for me was just heartbreaking because obviously I want my child to have a grandma and I want my my mum to be able to experience my child because I know how much she'd love to be a grandma. And so I wasn't sure how to approach this. And and so I did actually bring this up with her and I said, we need to work on our relationship because at the moment this is how I feel. I don't feel comfortable with this. And she stopped speaking to me. (laughs) And so then obviously, you know, six months later we decide to get pregnant and we get pregnant and I announce it and there's just silence, no acknowledgement. Nothing, which, you know, I was sort of expecting, so it wasn't, that wasn't a big shock. I, you know, I've, I've come to know my mum's behaviours quite well. Um, but then it got to the point where a couple of weeks ago I just went, you know, it's, it's what, three months until I'm going to bring this baby into the world and nothing has been resolved. 
And as it stands, I still don't feel comfortable with my mum being part of my child's life. And so, you know, I wrote her a letter saying, let's resolve this, let's work through it. Um, no response. <laughs> and then finally got dad to get her on the phone to me. And I realized in that five minute conversation that she wasn't willing to treat me in a loving way. Um, and so I had to set the boundary of saying, well, until you are, uh, you're not going to be welcome to see our child. And I think, you know, that the big learning for me is that it's okay to put yourself first and it's okay to say I'm not going to put myself in an unloving environment anymore and I'm going to look after the people around me, especially, you know, a new child. And it's not that I am angry at my mum or it's not that I feel badly for her. I actually feel so much compassion because I know that for her to treat me in such a horrible way is a reflection of how horribly she treats herself. Yeah. And so this isn't my stuff, but my journey obviously is accepting that it's okay to be self-loving in this way, which it is self-loving to not allow other people to disrespect you. And this is, you know, what led into this question is that we choose um, how people treat us. Um, and, you know, we, we if, if someone's not treating you well, you need to let them know that. And even if it is a family member, which makes it even harder because, you know, if you've been hanging out with this friend for a few years, it's much easier to go, oh, I'm just you know, not interested in that anymore. Yeah. But when it's a family member, there's all of this emotion around it. Um, well, and, you know, well, I mean, that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so um, me being, I've had to open myself up to being okay with that and accepting and accepting that that's her journey as well. Yeah. Um, and you've had to grieve as well. I mean, this image of, having your mum around to help you being a mum, you know, which whether you've idealised that or not is just a part of the cultural conditioning, I suppose. Yeah. Um, expectation. It's, it's interesting because I think for many years I felt that she wouldn't be around, so I was okay with that. It's just that I didn't, I didn't want to deprive her of yeah. the opportunity to connect with my child, and there was a lot of guilt around that. Yes. That was what I had to work through. And also this lack of resolution and her not wanting to resolve with me and just, well, where did that leave me? How, how do we work through this? Yeah, and you actually just have to stick to your boundary, don't you? Yeah, and that's the thing that I hadn't done in the past. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's been these patterns that have played out for 35 years and then finally I go, no, this is my boundary. And this is also the gift of a child, I think. You know, it really brings you into your fierceness and clarity. <laughs> Whereas, like, it's not just me anymore. Mm -hmm. you know? Like, I'm pretty resilient. I can cope with this shit. I mean, it, that's exactly what happened to me. It was having my babe on my arm Yeah. that I went, Nicole, it's not okay to have this anxiety inside anymore. This, this yeah. energy is getting picked up by yeah. this innocent, pure little babe, and it's not okay. It was okay. I could cope with it myself. Yeah. But now that this is, this is influencing <laughs> another being, it's let's, going, deal with, let's deal with this shit. Yeah, it's going straight into that baby's self uh, subconscious, yeah. and that's forming their their relationship with them themselves and how yes. safe they feel in this world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me it was like, well, if my child sees my mother treating me in a certain way, it's going to teach my child that it's okay to disrespect people and it's okay to make snide comments at people and lie to people and do all these horrible things. And I don't want my child learning that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think, you know, you've just given us such a beautiful example and I know it's still, you know, so recent. And, Very fresh. And alive. <laughs> so I'm really so grateful for you to share that with us because I think whenever we set boundaries that are difficult, you know, and it's, it's the important ones that are difficult. Really. Yeah. It's the yeah. big life lesson, <laughs> like life changing ones that are difficult. Yeah. There's going to be discomfort. There's going to be guilt, fear. Oh my God. Is this truly like grief? There's going to be all of that going on. And yeah. 
to actually stick with loving yourself and having a bar about how you are going to be treated Mm. and loved Mm. and respected in the world is, you know, that's, it's life changing. It's, It's, (laughs) you know, so much more opens up for you Mm. in terms of what that self-love means. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's certainly been huge. Um, and, you know, I do have my husband to thank as well for that because, you know, when, when there's manipulative behaviours going on, it does make you question yourself and going, oh, am I being unreasonable? Maybe I should allow that person to treat me this way or, mm-hmm. you know, and there's all these family dynamics and when someone from the outside that's not emotionally attached can actually step in and go, you know what, that behaviour is horrendous and I wouldn't put up with that from anyone. Yeah. Then you can go, you know what? Okay, cool. I'm, all right. I'm, I'm justified yeah. in feeling how I feel, you know. Yes. So that has been instrumental for me as well, just his support. Um, mm. And, you know, obviously I've attracted in a relationship where my husband is, is going to be an amazing support with baby as well. So while I won't have, um, you know, a mother around to help with baby, my husband, he works from home as well. So we'll be able to do it together and, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Yes. Mm. How yeah. gorgeous. <laughs> How gorgeous. Yeah. Um, I absolutely loved reading your first novel as well. Mm-hmm. Can you just tell people a little bit about that? Because you share so intimately and so vulnerably, but what you share I don't know, there's something about reading another woman's journey through dating and sex and uh, love that just feels like a relief. (laughs) (laughs) So Getting Naked, the Dating Game was my second book. and um, I'm talking about the first one, Getting Naked. Yeah. That was my second book. The first one, mm, the second, the first one was The Upside of Down, which was a a journey and toolkit for overcoming depression, which was a memoir as well. And yeah, the second one, it started out as journal entries. Um, Every time I'd go on a doozy date, I'd come home and I'd write about it. And that was sort of my way of emptying out the trash, getting clear, getting the reflections, the learnings. Um, Then I'd go and clean the house and (laughs) go to the gym for a bit, get it all out of my system. And then I was fine. And so that's essentially how the book started. And I started accumulating all of these really funny dating stories and I was getting a lot of learnings out of it. And then I just went, you know what, I love love stories. But what I don't like about love stories is a lot of them don't actually show the real life stuff. And I want to portray that in a book. And so I started sharing, uh, well, started turning it into a novel and I made dating um, a bit of a research project. (laughs) <laughs> so I'd date lots of men and I'd, I'd see what I'd learnt and I even dated a woman at one stage. <laughs> and, um, you know, we um, it, it was a journey into learning more about myself and um, it was also a, an awakening for what I needed to learn about my relationship with me in order to have a healthy relationship with someone else. Because at that point, it was just like, oh, there's no good guys out there. And, you know, like guys are just idiots and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you tell yourself all of these stories when ultimately I was the common denominator in all of those situations. And obviously I was attracting in people that would mirror to me, like I was talking about that mirror reflection thing, would mirror to me what I needed to look at in order to have a healthy relationship. Um, and so it was through that journey, and, and obviously I share that in my book, um, that I was able to find my amazing husband and have a really beautiful relationship. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's just, it's a really brave book, I think. It's, you know, you're sharing stuff that most of us are, like, not sharing with even our best friends. <laughs> <laughs> But it's so refreshing because it's the conversations we, like you were saying, at the uh, when you go to parties now, people are like, oh, my God, I can finally talk about vaginas. Yeah. It's like, oh, my God, I can finally, yeah. There is an amazing with... amount of self-love and empowerment that comes from being able to speak openly about what you're experiencing. Yes, it's true. It's uh-huh. true. And I need to hear these words as I 
sit down to write my memoir. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because and, you know, we, we've got to go through this process as well of accepting where we're at and realising that we're human and that we have emotions and sometimes we say and do things that are a bit sucky and that's not a bad thing. It's just it's an opportunity to learn and, and see how we can become better people and more true to who we, tr- who we actually are. Um, and so it's really accepting that journey. Mm. Yeah, I feel like one of your gifts really is kind of like shame busting <laughs> shame buster <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah. yeah it's nearly like you know that whole Brene Brown thing that once it's shared yeah. and it's out there it has no power over us yeah unless there's still learnings to be had and then people will criticize it and you'll feel bad about yourself yes so something that I have learned is that I need to get complete resolution around something before I share it yeah yeah um, important, important. Or yeah, so share, share it, it. You know, sharing... share it to your friends. That's fine. But yeah, to, to you... that close, guiding, yes, emp- empathetic friend. Yeah. Um That's 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 different to sharing publicly. But but when you need to share publicly, it has to be fully resolved. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Otherwise, it'll be reflected back to you. What else you're yet to resolve within you? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I can talk to you all day and um, let's book in a cup of tea and we'll do that. (laughs) Um, Would you share with people your offerings and where they can find you? Yeah. So essentially I run an online school called Getting Naked and this is where I teach people how to strip off the layers of childhood conditioning so they can fall in love with themselves Um, because, you know, like, said self-love it's at the core of everything that we do um and you know I offer a one-on-one intensive program that I work with people you know that have a long-standing issue because of my history with depression and anxiety um I do work with a lot of clients around this and so I have through that 10 session program I help people become depression and pill free um, I also run a Remarkable Relationships course, which is an online course. You still get lots of one-on-one support from me. And the idea is to teach you how to become your own healer so then that you can clear that childhood conditioning so then that you can have a healthy relationship with you and you can actually heal whatever ailment it is in your life, whether it be a physical ailment, whether it be a relationship ailment, whether it be um, an emotional thing that's going on for you. Um, And then the other program, which we launched this year, which I'm very excited about and obviously is very relevant to what we've been chatting chatting about today, is Yoga for the Vagina. Um, And this is a restorative and healing yoga practice that teaches the the art of self-love while at the same time helping your sexual organs stay ripe and resilient well into your twilight years. And so it's designed specifically for the female body. It's a really lush practice. And it uses the jade egg to release trauma and conditioning so that women can resensitize their vaginal tissue and experience really beautiful, deep, heartfelt pleasure. Mm. Well, they're my main. Yeah. And you also sell the jade eggs if people are wondering yeah. where to get them from. Yeah. Yeah. So the two websites are gettingnaked.com.au for that's sort of my main website. Um, but if you are interested in yoga for the vagina, go to yoga for the vagina.com. And that's a website I've set up specifically to talk about um, women's health. And vaginas. Yes. <laughs> Our beautiful lady parts. <laughs> oh, excellent. All right. Well, I hope um, there's some women out there that are inspired to get to know their vaginas a little more. I'm sure you have inspired that in them. Thank you so much for talking to me. Today. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode i would be so grateful if you could take a moment to leave a review and rating over at itunes or just share this episode with someone who you think would really benefit from hearing it if you need more support in your relationship i have online workshops courses and one-on-one sessions available with me over on my website www.nicolematheson.com where you can also find the show notes for this episode. Thanks for listening. Until next time, bye-bye.